negotiations and the role of regional players in the progress of these talks. The official meeting in Doha this past weekend was cancelled due to a disagreement over who should be in attendance. But some reports suggest that private meetings between the Taliban and some other attendees have been positive. The role of the US and regional partners will heavily influence the shape and success of any future political resolution in Afghanistan. Today's discussion aims to explore the contours of these relationships and the potential roles regional partners may play in supporting or undermining an eventual Afghan peace process. Moderating this discussion with Ambassador Omar Samad, Daud Khattak, and Michael Kugelman will be the center's non-resident senior fellow, Fatima Man. Fatima has monitored and written on Iranian, Afghan, and other Middle Eastern affairs for over 20 years. Born in Iran, she left for Europe in her teens in 1980s and moved to the US in 1994. Having advised and worked with various US government institutions on Afghanistan, and Iran since 2008, Fatima has traveled extensively to South Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. Fatima was a TV writer, producer, anchor at Voice of America until 2008, and prior to that, a correspondent with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, from 1999 through 2007. She has written broadly on Iran and other aspects of Middle Eastern and South Asian affairs. Thank you all for being here. I would now like to welcome the panelists to the stage for this timely discussion. Thank you. Uh, should I start here or just sit? All right. So, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here. Uh, I'm Fatima Aman, as you just heard. Um, it's been um, years since the uh, Afghan government first sat down with the Taliban, um, you know, trying to reach a settlement. But Taliban <laughs> expanded its violence. Uh, every time it was close to come to a conclusion, perhaps to increase its leverage in these negotiations. For years, the Taliban requested direct negotiations with the US government uh, without the presence of the Afghan government. Uh, so insisting that the government was a foreign puppet. Finally, the wish was granted by the United States and in September, Master Salmoy Khalilzad was assigned to represent the United States in direct talk with the Taliban. Um, so Taliban political uh, spokesman just uh, recently said that uh, they uh, came to an agreement with the United States that uh, for complete withdrawal of US, U.S. troops from Afghanistan, they would prevent uh, terrorist groups from you know, using Afghanistan as a safe haven, which was denied uh, completely by Ambassador Khalil Zad, uh, saying that the uh, talks of U.S. withdrawal, uh, you know, there was no talks of with U.S. withdrawal uh, at this point. He said the next phase in is intra-Afghan talks which unfortunately didn't happen and was uh, postponed indefinitely. It was supposed to take place uh, last week. So at this point, many countries and some regional players and allies are involved in the talks with the Taliban, but not Afghan, Afghanistan uh, government. Uh, mm, and uh, now, uh, is the peace talk in a major setback? Does Taliban have any desire for peace at all? Can negotiations lead to any solution without the Afghan government's participation? What role, if any, does Pakistan play in all this? Uh, and can India avoid involvement with the Taliban, you know, considering broad investment that India has in uh, Afghanistan? So to answer these and many more questions, we are delighted to be hosting this event with an excellent panel of experts from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, uh, from uh, our very own Atlantic Council South Asia Center, and uh, from Wilson Center. Uh, I'm sure you are fa familiar with all of them, with their work. Uh, Dawood Khattak, uh, Khattak sitting next to me is a reporter and a senior editor
for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Radio Mashal. That's a radio that was launched in 2010, uh, countering uh, numerous uh, radio stations uh, uh, with, uh, you know, uh, ex uh, extremist radio ex uh, stations, both in Khaybar uh, Pakhtun Khwa region and also tribal area between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, Dawood's documentary, Vanishing History, won a, was a winner at uh, Berlin's Short Film Festival in 2018. His upcoming documentary is about a, an ancient uh, religion that is threatened by the Islamic es extremism, where people are, uh, feel forced to convert to Islam. Then we have uh, uh, Ambassador Omar Samad, uh, who is a uh, non-resident uh, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council South Asia Center. Uh, Omar is the president and founder of Silk Road Consulting. He is uh, Afghanistan's former ambassador to France and Canada. He is a former spokesperson for Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Kabul and uh, a senior advisor to uh, uh, Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah, former advisor. Um, prior to joining Atlantic Council, uh, Omar was a uh, expert in resident with the USIP. Uh, then we have uh, Michael Kugelman, uh, the Deputy Director of the Asia Program and Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. Uh, Michael is a leading expert on Afghanistan, India, and Pakistan, and their relations with the United States. Uh, he is the editor or co-editor of only 11 books, uh, and has written for the New York Times, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, and many other publications. Uh, he occasionally causes earthquakes on Twitter. So let's start with Dawood. Uh, Dawood, you heard about the uh, ongoing talks now being postponed. And that gives the impression that Taliban doesn't want to talk at all. You see, uh, what's holding back the Taliban? Uh, and uh, are they ready for talks at all? Thank you. Thank you very much, Padme. And uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with such informed people, Michael Kugelman and Umar Samad and no doubt Fatme. Well, um, as all of you know that the second round of intra-Afghan uh, talks uh, scheduled to be held in Qatar, Doha, it has been postponed. And the apparent reasons are very obvious because it was on the number of participants uh, in the uh, second round of talks. Uh, why, what is, we will see what is coming, what is upcoming, and what is not coming. When, uh, the Taliban came for the first time to the, uh, to the table uh, with the Afghan uh, US, with US ambassador, uh, Zalmay Khalid Zad, peace ambassador. So initially they agreed uh, to uh, say that they are not going to give any place to terrorists in Afghanistan. So that, that was the first point of agreement there. On the other hand, they were asking the US for uh, some goodwill gesture, and as part of the prisoner exchange, they released some prisoner from there. So that was a kind of developing the, uh, like the confidence building. Now what is not coming uh, on both sides? Uh, Taliban uh, first demand from the US is now to uh, announce a withdrawal uh, date from Afghanistan. That is not coming right now. And the United States and Afghan government wants the Taliban to uh, declare a kind of ceasefire, maybe that, that should be temporary or permanent, but uh, Taliban are not coming for that uh, ceasefire. These are the three sides of this uh, conflict. Uh, the regional side is also there, and among the regional sides, uh, when, when we discuss the regional sides are the neighbors of uh, Afghanistan, uh, Pakistan name comes uh, on the top. So in a way, we can say that uh, Pakistan is also uh, a kind of uh, playing a role, although indirectly, because the direct players are uh, Afghanistan, Taliban, and the United States in this conflict. So uh, Pakistan, uh, as all of you know, and it is always reported in the media that the Taliban have their uh, presence uh, inside Pakistan, and uh, 
you can also see that Pakistan have, has uh, some kind of leverage on the Taliban. So what the Afghan government and the United States wants, want Pakistan to bring the Taliban to peace talks and to, in a kind, to apply pressure on, on them to announce a kind of uh, cease uh, fire. It's very clear that Pakistan, it was very clearly mentioned that Pakistan uh, used its influence on the Taliban in the very beginning to uh, bring them to the negotiation table. Uh, and also Pakistan recently uh, allowed some Taliban leaders to travel to Qatar and they uh, participated in the peace talks. Uh, what is not coming from the Pakistani side it <coughs> is to apply a full pressure on the uh, Taliban uh, to, to declare a kind of, to announce a kind of ceasefire. So that is not coming from the Pakistani side. Uh, what Pakistan wants, Pakistan wants very clear guarantees that the Afghan soil should not be used against uh, Pakistan. That is the apparent concerns that we are hearing from officials and we are hearing from uh, Pakistani commentators and we are reading in the press. So uh, Pakistan wants very clear guarantees. And I think uh, when Ashraf Ghani first time visited uh, Pakistan in uh, 2000, uh, November 2014, I think, after his election, uh, this issue was very clearly discussed. And uh, Ashraf Ghani presented four uh, like solutions for all these things. One of those solutions was that uh, if Pakistan wants to uh, start some uh, like reconstruction projects are to help the Afghans, we are open to all these things. Uh, if India is coming here for reconstruction, mm. of course, we will allow India to do that. But if I India is coming for some sort of uh, like anti-Pakistan activities, we are very clearly mentioning that that will not happen. We will stop there. So that was almost agreed. Now there must be some hurdles on both sides and they'll know that very well. Uh, let me be very can yes. I get a yes. few more minutes? Yes, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, I think uh, about the Taliban the talks, there are uh, concerns, uh, concerns among the regional players, concerns among Afghans, uh, and concerns among the government. <coughs> the government is feeling left out. The local Afghans, uh, if you talk to them, uh, they are concerned about the human rights because the Taliban record of human rights in the mid-90s and before the 9-11, uh, that was not very good and they have concerns about the women's rights, they have concerns about the ongoing reconstruction projects, education, all these things. Uh, but there are hopes also. Mm, if we look at the, uh, mm, like the post 9-11, Afghanistan is not the Afghanistan, and I think all of you know very well, Afghanistan is not the Afghanistan of the pre-9-11 times. Now, a younger generation is there, uh, almost 30 million, I think half of the population of Afghanistan, 30 million have access to internet and they are the youth, of, uh, not access to internet, they are the youth, and most of the youth are in favor of the ongoing process in Afghanistan. Uh, they, they are favoring human, like uh, respect for human rights, they're favoring education for women. Uh, now, a new trend is coming and that is the, uh, what I can say, uh, a social media revolution where the region is uh, like, uh, it is spreading in the region in Pakistan, Afghanistan is also uh, not left out. The social media revolution is there. And I can't and I will never imagine that if Taliban come into like in the government or they are getting some sort of share in the uh, government, so they will be the same Taliban, like they will be doing the same thing as they were doing to women or they were doing the human rights violation. Because there is the social media revolution, there is the awareness level, there is the education <coughs> level, there is the ongoing reconstruction projects, and I think the youth population, that is the only guarantee against all these things. So that is the message of uh, hope. I think the only thing, and to the last, to the end, is that the international community must, uh, uh, like, issue a last warning to the uh, neighbors and the regional that stop it. Once they stop the interference, I think Afghans have the skills and they uh, have the guts to come together and uh, like resolve their problems. Not very like immediately, but in a in in a longer run. And very last positive signs are that when I was opening in a Pashto website uh, today, this morning before coming here, I found three very good news. The first news was news was that Afghan cricket team is was announced 
for the 2019 World Championship. They announced their team. That was not happening in Afghanistan. The second was there is a protest in Helmand province against Taliban's spring offensive. That was not happening. Rather, Taliban were garlanded when they entered Kabul in, uh, in, in the mid-90s. And that was the reaction against warlords. Now there are no warlords, so they are not going to be garlanded. And the third news is that the uh, power generation from Naglu Dam, power dam, it is doubled, now 100 megawatt. So <laughs> I think things are happening like this. So he is optimistic for now. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Ambassador. Thank you. Um, happy to be here uh, and uh, have this discussion in a very timely manner. I don't know if you actually plan planned it this way or not, but uh, it makes it more interesting uh, because I was hoping that we would be coming here after the intro Afghan talks would be taking place and discussing what is going they to happen next, yes. what will be the next stage. But that this does, did, did not happen for a variety of reasons, uh, I would say, um, uh, that uh, the, this so-called meet and greet um, conference that was supposed to take place, and I'm emphasizing on meet and greet because it was not supposed to be a negotiations conference. It was not meant to, uh, uh, for the two sides, all the sides involved, to negotiate on uh, very complex detailed issues. It was just to meet and get to know each other. Uh, so it didn't. Uh, there are different uh, reasons for which uh, it didn't, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, uh, obviously, there's a lot of finger pointing right now going on, but there's also a lot of uh, talk about trying to revive it. Even Secretary Pompeo, I think, in a talk with uh, President Ghani uh, in the last 24 hours or so, uh, uh, alluded to the fact that they would like to see this process going forward. Uh, I think Zalmay Khalizad has also issued some tweets saying that he wants this process to go forward, whereas in Kabul there's somewhat of a disconnect and disarray on this. There are those who say that this was done on purpose, that it was a sabotage type tactic. Uh, others are saying that it was mismanaged, like I think uh, Chief Executive Abdullah said that this morning, uh, that, they, that the Doha talks were mismanaged. And so there are all kinds of different uh, views on it. Uh, everybody has expressed, uh, you know, their regrets, their regrets about these talks not going forward. But the, you see, this shows that uh, Afghanistan's issues obviously are very complex. They are very politicized, and there are those who uh, still have yet to decide as to whether Afghanistan's priority issues have to deal with peace and peacemaking. War, more war, less war, uh, 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 or politics. Because remember, the, the shift, the sort of shift that took place in the last almost nine months or so with the U.S.'s South Asia policy was is a, a decision to aim for ending the war and a decision to find a political settlement for Afghanistan. Uh, that decision obviously has been pursued by U.S. efforts bilateral talks with the Taliban, uh, talks with many regional players, and talks with Afghans of all different backgrounds. And Afghans who sometimes do share their views and have common views, and sometimes do not have common views. And so this is all reflected in the politics that is involved right now. Uh, so depending on who you talk to, some would be pro-peace at any cost, Others would be peace under certain circumstances and conditions. Others would be probably reluctant in saying that we need more time, uh, that this is not the right time for engaging the Taliban. And even go to the point where some are saying, well, the Taliban are the same Taliban of the 1990s. They haven't changed. Nothing is going to change. We need to continue the conflict. We need to continue the war. At the end of the day, I think what we need to do is pause for a second and think about the last almost 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan, how, what have we achieved over the last 20 years? Uh, how close are we to real peace and a real settlement that is owned by Afghans and that everybody else can get on board with? Everybody else obviously maybe with some exceptions but more or less get on board with in the region and beyond. And how can it help the end of what the US and NATO consider as their 
uh, engagement in Afghanistan. Uh, and so we have to really think, uh, you know, from, is it a few miles above? We have to take a look at the bigger picture. And if you get entangled with nitty gritty politics, either in Kabul or whether it's in Islamabad or whether it's in Washington or Doha or anywhere, I think that you are going to lose sight of what needs to happen and what this country needs at this point. Afghanistan needs a break from conflict in war. How do we reach that? How do we accomplish that? And under what conditions? What do we give, give up? What do we not give up? Where are those red lines that everybody is talking about? We have to come to terms with that. And the Afghans have to do that on their own, in their own house. Because at the end of the day, we, the Taliban, whether we like it or not, are a reality will remain a reality for as long as they are there. And if this is going to be an Afghan solution, an all-encompassing all -encompassing Afghan solution, at some point we really need to have all sides involved, all sides sit around the table. Right now, politics has become uh, an obstacle. And it's short-term politics. It's tied to elections in Afghanistan. It's tied to campaigning in Afghanistan. It's tied to power. And, 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 and either sharing power, how do we share power? How are we going to give up power to some extent or gain power? And at the end of the day, I'm of the belief that you have to resort to a democratic process. Sure. But in, in order for us to move the democratic process forward, we have to learn the lessons from the past. We haven't had a very good democratic experimentation in Afghanistan. We have had a lot of very bad issues and the people of Afghanistan have lost confidence in the system. So the system has to, on one hand, be rebooted and reformed so that people regain confidence in the democratic process in Afghanistan. That democratic process has to involve all Afghans, including the Taliban, we hope. Because for me, that is a red line, for example. Or their behavior towards women and minorities and others is a red line, of course. But all of that has to be in brought up at the negotiating table. This is not something that we can play politics with and think that we can move the process forward. The process has to move forward, whether it's through Doha or any other venue, because there's a push now to move the process away from Doha for whatever political reasons exist. And at the end of the day, I think that if all parties agree, that's fine. But what we need to be conscious of is that there is bloodletting every day in Afghanistan that there are between 100 to 200 people being killed in the country every day, that there are certain aspects of the system that are not sustainable, that there, is, there are risk factors that we need to be very aware of, whether they're internal to Afghanistan or whether they are regional, uh, and that there is a decision that has been taken here in Washington that is strategic, and that strategic decision is that at some point, the Americans want to leave, and we do not know when that decision will be taken, how it will be taken. We all hope that it will be responsible, a responsible decision. There will be taken a, a decision that will not lead to more chaos, but less, and will leave behind a stable Afghanistan. I just want to say a few words about the region, because there's a lot going on, and then we can move on. There's also right now uh, a lot of consultation going on between the Americans, the Russians, and the Chinese, amongst others. And I think that, uh, knowing that all these countries have their own distinct you know, interests uh, that are part of great power rivalries, uh, but there are also, you can see, an emerging uh, overlapping of understanding of interests concerning Afghanistan and the way forward between these uh, powers. Uh, that's, what, that's what you see, the, you know, the, 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 I think Khalilzad is meeting the Russians again very soon, maybe today or tomorrow. Uh, uh, he's engaged in, in, in talks again uh, that will take him to Islamabad, to New Delhi, uh, to, the, to London, and to Qatar, and to Kabul, of course. Uh, so there is a push, again, for um, uh, focusing on what's priority. Yes, the intra-Afghan talks are still a priority. How it will shape up, we have to see and wait. Uh, but there's also um, you know, the possibility that the Americans are going to continue to put their weight and pursue a bilateral uh, engagement with the Taliban and do what is necessary in terms of 
the agenda that they have with the Taliban and how that can um, undermine or help mm -hmm. the other parts of the agenda, we don't know. Pakistan, since we've talked about it, as I, I think I agree with Dawood that Pakistan seems to have helped to some extent the U.S. efforts and that uh, even under some pressures from the Gulf states and so on and so forth, uh, and some even some incentives at times, that they have facilitated uh, talks with the Taliban. They have made it easier for the Taliban to uh, engage in talks. The fact that Mullah Brother uh, uh, is involved now is an indication of that. But there are still a lot of expectations from all sides, especially from Afghans, uh, on what role uh, the Pakistan would play from now on, and whether that role is going to be a spoiler role, uh, a, a role that is going to change over time and either become more constructive or less constructive, uh, that r remains to be seen. And, and, the, and obviously the, the connection that Pakistan policy has with how it views its relationship with India uh, is, is a, a driver of all of this. A quick note on the fact that we also see some interesting signs about how the EU and the U.S., at times are not seeing eye to eye on Afghanistan these days. And some of that may be related to transatlantic relations mm. right now, and the fact that there are some tensions between the EU and the US. And it's interesting for Afghans to see that maybe Afghanistan is an item on this, and you know, that, that sort of ties to this relationship, and that the EU is uh, taking a different stance, a more independent stance on this. Then obviously we, we also cannot ignore the fact that there's Iran, and Iran, obviously is concern, is, continues to be a source of concern. As we, Iran uh, uh, tries to navigate these new waters uh, with US sanctions and pressures, also pressures in the Middle East, uh, its relationship with Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, and, uh, and occasional threats of retaliation by the Iranians, uh, and how that plays into Afghanistan, and, and, wa and what role, either constructive or not so constructive, Iran can play uh, uh, in, in, in the Afghan case itself. Uh, then obviously you cannot also ignore the Russians and to some extent the Eastern, East, the Central Asians. Um, Uzbekistan uh, wants to play a greater role these days. Uh, there's even talk of wanting to shift from Doha to uh, either Tashkent or Samarkand somewhere in Uzbekistan. Uh, again, as I said, that is a very politicized uh, issue. Uh, but you can see that uh, there is concern in Central Asia as to what may happen, and the Russians obviously continue to keep a very close eye on what is happening and seem to be coordinating more, coordinating more and more with the, uh, with the Americans as well. So I, I will stop here because there's so I much more to talk about, to and, and I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, a regional overview. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Michael? You need this one. Sure, I'll use it unless I'm told otherwise. Uh, well, thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, I don't know if this is a case of saving the best for last. It's a very distinguished panel, so it's a pleasure to be on it. Um, what I'll do for in my allotted five minutes is just to uh, briefly highlight three central conundrums for U.S. policy as I see them in this story. Uh, one of them is these U.S. Taliban talks themselves. Uh, on the one hand, as we all know, they're incredibly messy and risky, um, but on the other hand, they need to take place from the perspective of U.S. policy. Uh, you know, the U.S. is really breaking all the rules of negotiations 101. Uh, it's gone into these talks with relatively little leverage. It's negotiating from a position of weakness. This is not the way to, uh, to get to yes, so to speak. Um, and more broadly, there's clearly a something wrong with a situation of Kabul being blocked out of the talks, at least at this early stage. And there's good reason to fear that the Taliban could well renege on any commitments that it may make in a deal uh, with the United States or with Kabul. But these talks are really the right policy choice for the United States. They have to happen. And I would argue not just because President Trump really wants a deal to give him cover to get out of Afghanistan. Why do I say this? One, you know, there really is no other option at this point uh, for, for US policy. You know, we know that military options, military victory is not an option unless you were to have a situation of NATO sending in hundreds of thousands of forces, which will not happen and, and should not happen. Also, um, as I think Ambassador Samad alluded to before, the war is getting worse and worse. All of the trend lines are really very troubling. Uh, Afghan security and civilian casualty figures have broken new records, or they broke new records last year, according to the UN. 
drugs which fund much of the insurgency are still being produced robustly. Uh, drug harvests have also broken records in recent years. And of course, as we know, the Taliban, it has more territory than at any time before or ever since U.S. troops entered in 2001. And finally, uh, uh, the conditions are arguably as favorable now uh, as they've ever been for talks. And President Trump, at least at this point, has fully empowered the State Department and Khalil Zad in, uh, specifically to pursue an agreement. Whenever you talk to people within the State Department, as I have recently, there's just a lot of optimism that something is really going to happen this time. Now, is that optimism misplaced? Uh, perhaps, but you're still, you're still hearing that. And meanwhile, as I think we heard before, the Taliban is, is really taking these talks um, more seriously than many of us would have assumed uh, some months ago. They're, they've sent some of their top people uh, to these talks, including a chief of staff to the supreme leader of, of the Taliban. So you could argue that you would not roll out your big guns if, uh, if you just see these talks as some type of tease. Uh, so that's, that's the point to make there. Second central conundrum for U.S. policy in this story is that, the United, and this gets to the regional story, uh, the United States is really stuck with a, a major lost opportunity um, to cooperate with Afghanistan's neighbors on peace and reconciliation. Uh, broadly speaking, the United States and Afghanistan's neighbors, they, they support the uh, same end game in Afghanistan in the sense that they want Afghanistan not to be at war, they want Afghanistan to be more uh, stable. Um, their interests are ultimately better served by Afghanistan not being at war than Afghanistan being at war. So ongoing war, deepening destabilization, it increases the likelihood of outcomes that are undesirable for Afghanistan's neighbors. So things like an increased drug trade, heightened refugee flows, cross-border terrorism, new sanctuaries for terrorism, these are not outcomes that are desirable for India, for China, for Russia, for Iran, and the Central Asian states. What about Pakistan? Well. I would argue that they're, they're not desirable for Pakistan either, which of course has played such a significant role uh, in driving instability in Afghanistan through the support that is provided for, uh, for the Taliban. Um, the United States sees eye to eye with the region on a broad level, uh, but the problem here, the conundrum, is that prospects for cooperation between the United States and the region in terms of moving forward and peace and reconciliation issues, the problem is that the United States does not get along with the region. Um, you know, other than, other than India, Washington's relations with Afghanistan's neighbors are, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're problematic. They range from very limited to deeply problematic to outright hostile. Um, and, you know, the, the top U.S. frenemies, so to speak, like Pakistan, for example, uh, and its top strategic rivals like Iran and China, Russia, they're all in, they're all in this part of the world. Uh, so that's, that's, that's another major conundrum. Third and final uh, major conundrum for the United for U.S. policy in this story, as I see it, it gets into the issue of Afghan politics. Um, these talks with the Taliban, these U.S. talks with the Taliban, which, as I said before, really are the right thing to do, not because they're ideal, but because there's no other option. Um, they really pose the risk of making U.S. relations with the Afghan government very difficult, and at a critical moment in Afghanistan and for Afghan politics. Uh, the political future, Afghanistan's immediate political future is rather cloudy. It's, it's rather unsettled uh, for a variety of reasons that we all know. The schisms within the government, pressure on the government, and particularly President Ghani from outside, uh, the uncertain direction of reconciliation efforts, and of course an election in Afghanistan that is supposed to happen in September. It's already been delayed several times. We don't know if it's going to happen, even though it's supposed to. Um, now, the Supreme Court in Afghanistan, as I understand it, very recently ruled that President Ghani is the president and he will remain president. He will be the lawful president until there is an election. Um, that's, that's important. That could help. But it's not going to ease the, uh, the pressure on the government and particularly on the president, particularly once we get to next month and you could start hearing more uh, expressions of concern that this government is no longer a legitimate government. So the U.S. needs to needs its relationship to work with Kabul, um, particularly at such a difficult, turbulent time. And yet, so long as it cont continues to pursue these bilateral talks with the Taliban, that relationship is it, it could well be be quite strained. Uh, so to conclude, I, I think a big question for U.S. policy is, um, you know, can you square these circles in these three cases? Um, can they be squared? Should they be squared? And you know, can the U.S. move forward? without trying to square them. And of course, there are more, there are more conundrums than the three I highlighted, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>
All right, thank you, Michael. Um, David, I skipped the first time you were, uh, you were allowed to say something. You know, I started directly with the questions, but I give you a chance to uh, say whatever you missed. But fine. the question, you know, uh, according to Michael, uh, Pakistan is uh, ha not just Michael, actually. Uh, almost everybody thinks or there is a perception that if, Talib if Pakistan decides overnight there uh, could be some peace in Afghanistan. If, Tal if uh, Pakistan stops supporting Taliban, it would change the whole situation. Do you, what's the incentive for Pakistan to be uh, cooperating in, in Afghanistan and, and, bringing and uh, encouraging Taliban to come to the peace talks? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the very first concern that we are hearing from Pakistani <coughs> officials and the uh, Pakistani people uh, is that uh, Pakistan has its uh, concern about uh, Indian role uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, and it's very open and it's very clear. They generally believe that uh, uh, India is, uh, there is a kind of encirclement from the Indian side. Now, uh, how much uh, that uh, Pakistani concern is uh, like uh, based on truth or how much carries that concern carries for weight. Uh, I won't say like in details, but as I'm hearing the Afghan officials and President Ghani, I think they are again and again assuring the Pakistani officials that if India is coming here and they are doing something against Pakistan, so uh, we are not going to let, let them uh, do it. I, th uh, I think in, in, in very general terms, uh, it's a question of sitting together. Right now in Pakistan and Afghanistan, there are a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, and, uh, like, uh, and I think sometimes the militants and the, uh, the, the groups which are fighting inside Afghanistan are fighting inside Pakistan. They are also using these uh, weaknesses and these uh, misunderstanding because we have a history of uh, Pakistan-Afghanistan talks. Sometimes Pakistani officials are visiting, sometimes Afghan officials are visiting. In recent times, the very good times that I witnessed personally, that was the visit of President Ashraf Ghani in November 2014 when he came to Islamabad. And there was a, an atmosphere of goodwill and uh, people on both sides of the border were very much hopeful that he is a new president, he is coming, and there was a new prime minister in Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, and one of the powerful uh, prime minister. This environment, it continues for some times. Uh, there are exchanges of diplomats, there are exchanges of prime ministers, and then all of a sudden something happens. For example, a bomb blast mm. somewhere in the Pakistani border areas or in the Afghan border areas. Another bomb blast and everything is like shattered. So I think uh, there must be some sort of understanding on both sides. There must be some sort of like uh, a, a permanent channel uh, between the two countries that can avoid uh, such kind of uh, like such kind of events and that can continue the uh, the talks that can continue the context uh, to to remove the misunderstanding once and for all and only then I think Pakistan will be assured that uh, Afghanistan is Afghanistan's ground is not used against Pakistan and Afghans will be assured that Pakistan's ground is not used against yeah. uh, Afghanistan. But mostly the other side around. You know, everybody is uh, the uh, general perception is that the uh, uh, extremists uh, or uh, militants enter pa Afghanistan from the Pakistan side, you know, from a uh, tribal area. But uh, can Pakistan afford uh, abandoning uh, uh, Taliban, the Taliban? Can they do that? You know, what, as I, he, so both of you. Well, uh, you're Michael, right. Michael, after. Okay. Go ahead, I'll go, I'll follow. Sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Okay, but let me finish in one minute. Sure. You are right when you are saying that there is a general perception that it's Pakistan from where the militants are going into Afghanistan. That is because the Taliban leadership, I think it's not something hidden because recently the Taliban leadership traveled from Pakistan to Qatar, so it's not something hidden. And the Taliban leadership have their, like for example, their families are some of the leaderships are there. When Mullah Mansoor, Akhtar Mansoor was coming from Iran, he was killed in a drone strike inside Pakistani areas. So that, that's very clear. It's not, and this is why this is giving the perception to the outside world and to Afghans that Pakistan is doing something, they, Pakistan is supporting the Taliban and they are creating uh, problems uh, inside 
uh, Afghanistan. So far, the uh, Taliban parting, um, Pakistan parting ways with the Taliban once and for all. I think uh, Pakistan has very long-term relations with the Taliban. And like all of a sudden snapping all kind of contacts, I, I don't think in the policy <coughs> circles in Pakistan that will be something that will be seen as a realistic uh, uh, step. Because Taliban, Afghan Taliban, it's not only a simple Taliban. They have their connections, they have their roots. For example, there is Lashkari Jangvi. For example, there are the other Pakistani Taliban groups. So all these groups have their connections with each other. Sometimes they are like, uh, like the cutting each other, but sometimes they are like pretty uh, together with each other. So if Pakistan creates some problems for the Afghan uh, Taliban all of a sudden and say that you are out and they are starting a kind of operations, I believe that there will be a lot of problems for the Pakistani government, not only from the Afghan Taliban, but also from the Pakistani Taliban, different sectarian okay. groups. And the so you assume that there is a central, uh, you know, uh, this is, not a, this is not a very tight country. relationship. Okay. This is a very loose relationship. Even the Taliban or our own organization is a very loose organization. It's not a very tight organization like this. Sure. Because this is, a, uh, this is a, a, an insurgency and this is a militant group. This is not some army like where a command and control is very tight. But otherwise, they have some sort of contacts with each other. Okay. Michael, do you want to respond? Yeah, I'll be, I'll be brief. I mean, my point earlier was just to draw out a paradox, uh, essentially that Pakistan has contributed to the instability in Afghanistan in a big way, even though it does derive major benefits from a more stable Afghanistan. That was, that was my point. But to the broader question, you know, Pakistan wants a government in Afghanistan that will be friendly to Pakistan and unfriendly to India in an ideal world. So in that regard, having a post war government in Afghanistan, if we can even use terms like that at this early point, a post-war government in Afghanistan that has some type of Taliban role, that would serve Pakistani interests very well. Um, just because one would assume that a government with a Taliban presence would not necessarily be as receptive to having a major Indian presence in Afghanistan, which I would underscore is largely a development economic one. Uh, so that, that, that's the point, but we, but we don't know. I mean, what, if we're talking about a government in which the Taliban, or former Taliban uh, members serve one role and you have other factions that are there, that could make things uh, different. But I think that the India question is, is always huge when you're trying to think about Pakistani calculations in Afghanistan. Okay. Can I, can yes, I just yeah, absolutely. Uh, offer a little perspective? I don't know if this is working. Um, uh, we all know what the last 25 years have brought in terms of Pakistan's role, Taliban connections to <coughs> Pakistan, the India-Pakistan issues, and how Afghanistan has had to deal with it. Um, and since the emergence of the Taliban 25 years ago, we, I'm not going to go even before that how things mm -hmm. were part of a certain strategy, but I see a consistency in Pakistani strategy that seem now to have an opportunity to take a different route. And not only with Afghanistan, but also in the broader region, in, in with India as well, but we see that there are very raw tensions between the, those two countries as well, and they have their impact and their effect on Afghanistan, and how uh, the whole issue is being driven uh, because uh, of those tensions uh, and perceptions that are difficult and hard to die, mm. uh, and the mistrust, the trust deficit that has existed for all these years. But we, I think, we also are. Uh, at a juncture where we have new opportunities. I think we have new opportunities with the paradigm that has existed and how it can shift for Pakistan. And again, uh, in the broader region as well as with, with Afghanistan, how it deals with, the, with uh, uh, militant groups uh, and non-state actors, how it deals with uh, you know, uh, using proxies for foreign and security policy issues, uh, and also for Afghans. Also for Afghans as well, it offers new opportunities to, uh, to look at a more constructive, more positive uh, uh, approach to all its neighbors and to a, a new environment. Um, and I think that the continuation of conflict and war that has been imposed on Afghanistan mainly and the issues that exist within Afghanistan and the rifts and the fault lines that it has exacerbated within Afghanistan 
um, have to be resolved uh, in such a manner as to leading to, to a settlement and peace and bringing in some of those, not all, maybe not all, I don't know, uh, we will see, but some of these militant elements, including the Afghan Taliban, maybe some will break away and not want to have peace, but those who do, mm -hmm. uh, and bring them under the tent, the Afghan tent, uh, as we did with Hekmatyar, for example, mm. uh, and, and, and see if we can all together uh, create a new uh, setup. And that is the goal, because uh, otherwise the, op the other alternative is more war. The alternative is more suffering. The alternative is more chaos. And, you know, X, Y, Z will take political advantage of it, whether they're inside Afghanistan or outside Afghanistan. And that is not something that the Afghan people want today. The Afghan people are sick and tired of what is, what is happening. Uh, they have suffered heavily and continue to suffer. I don't know how much longer they can bleed uh, like this, profusely as they have, uh, and be, uh, you know, be a, a sort of an agent of political interests. Uh, that has to end, and we need to find a solution that works for as many stakeholders as possible sure. within Afghanistan and outside yeah. Afghanistan. So I, the next question is also for you. You mentioned uh, the accomplishment and achievement of uh, these 18 years uh, since the uh, fall of Taliban, you know, in terms of women rights, uh, minorities' rights. Uh, so uh, how would you uh, describe today, Afghan today, you know, Afghanistan uh, politically, economically, and uh, in terms of security. How stable is Afghanistan? And also, I would like to hear about those, some of those accomplishments and failures, you know, the, uh, the well, things we, that yeah, come to mind uh, before anything else. We have a long list of yeah. accomplishments and failures, unfortunately. A long list of lessons that have to be learned that I'm not sure we're learning very well uh, because it's, again, entangled with very sh short-term interest and political interest. Uh, uh, and so, we need to go beyond that. Um, and yeah, so we can talk about all the good things that have happened and the contributions that have been made by the international community, the hard work that Afghans have put in, the sacrifices that everybody has put in, in, in all the way from India and China who have contributed to, to Afghan reconstruction, to Japan and the European Union and America, of course, as the largest donor, and many others, and many others, and have shed blood in Afghanistan alongside Afghans. So there are things that need to be protected and safeguarded, and they need to be defended, and they need to be maintained. Uh, whether it's women's rights, whether it's, as I said earlier, the democratic process, but there are things that have to be amended and changed and uh, renegotiated. Uh, we need a, a, a transitional period within which uh, the Afghans come, all Afghans come under the tent, uh, and they can re reconfigure uh, uh, and learn from the lessons of the last 18, 20, uh, 19 years. Um, if there are needs, need, there's a need for uh, reforming the Constitution, we need to do that. If it, there's a need to broaden the scope, make it more democratic, uh, broaden the scope of rights, uh, make sure that uh, everyone feels comfortable with what we have, that's an Afghan-owned process that they have to carry out. We have issues because, again, as I said, uh, short-term politics come in, comes into play. Uh, and so, for example, we, we have a political process that was disrupted. We were supposed to go towards elections in 2019. We still are trying to go towards elections, but I agree, we do not know if elections actually can okay. or will take place or can take place under the security conditions that we have where more than 50% of the country is contested, where more and more of the population centers uh, change hands every day where the economy is really not doing very well, uh, if you cut the cord, the cordon sanitaire of funding coming from, from the outside, it will collapse. Mm -hmm. Where Afghan investment in money is going out, not coming in. Where Afghans themselves are actually walking out the country and not coming back to the country anymore because they don't feel comfortable. Yes. There are things that are not going well in, in the country and we need to take stock <coughs> of that. Governance, Fighting corruption has not done a very good job. You know, we Afghans, Afghans have to still to deal with huge corruption issues and accountability issues at the highest level all the way to down. So 
These are things that the Afghan people won't change with. The justice system needs to be changed and, 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 and become you know, more responsive. And, and obviously, I'm not saying that it has to be Talibanized. No, I'm saying that it has to respond to the wishes and needs of the population. And, and justice is something that is very dear and close to Afghan hearts, and they have suffered as a result of injustice. Sure. That has so, so these are the things that have to happen. But we have, for example, a process where right now, the next step is with Doha sort of on the sideline, the next step for the government is to form a jirga for peace. There, are, there, there is a lot of disagreement over this. And there are those who agree and those who disagree whether a jirga is necessary, what is the purpose, is it politicized, uh, and what, uh, what, would, would it, what will it accomplish at the end of the day? Is it going to fragment us more yeah. or will it unify us? Is it, for, uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is it tied to the political campaign in the elections? And then there's the whole question of somebody mentioned the legitimacy of this government. Is it ending? Is the Supreme Court ruling going to be accepted? Is it going to again create more chaos, less chaos? Is it fragmenting society, political society in Afghanistan? And, and the more fragmented we become, the more divided we become, whether it's in Kabul or outside of Kabul, over Afghanistan, the less the chances of finding the right solution. Excellent. Uh, we have uh, not much time. Just one question for Michael and one for Dawood. Uh, Michael, how long do you think India can stay away from getting involved actively, more actively with the Taliban? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, considering the investments that broad investment of India in Afghanistan. Right. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting. We all remember a few months ago, uh, two retired Indian diplomats were sent to uh, the the informal talks in in Moscow, which sort of pushed back against this idea that the that New Delhi doesn't want any part of a process um, with the Taliban, uh, and particularly one that includes Pakistan's role. Um, so I do think that so long as Pakistan continues to play the role that it's playing now, which is what seems to be a facilitative role um, in the talks with the United States, it'll be difficult for, for India to, um, to be involved. I do think, though, that um, now, of course, India is in the middle of an election. We don't know yet what the next government's going to look like. But I think we can assume whatever it looks like um, that the long time, the long standing Indian policy of not playing a major security role in, in Afghanistan, that policy is not going to change. I just don't see that changing. I don't see India putting boots on the ground. Uh, there's been some, some uh, suggestions that President Trump over uh, the last two years or over the last year or so on one or two occasions has put out there this idea of India actually sending troops into Afghanistan. I don't think New exactly. Delhi will do that. Um, but you know, this idea that Afghanistan could become increasingly unstable, and if there's no peace deal or no agreement, you know, that could have major deleterious consequences for India, and therefore it needs to do more to try to um, contribute to st stability by providing its own security resources. I just don't see that happening. Maybe you know something like um, arms sales, something like that. India has contributed a few uh, fighter training helicopters. Even, yeah, yeah, and tr yeah, training and advising, I think, is the big fact. That's, that's really the big focus of Indian security policies. I just think it, India feels it has its hands tied in Afghanistan because it knows that if it were to take on that greater security role, if it were to try to um, establish a military footprint in Afghanistan, Pakistan clearly would respond in ways that could be very troubling for, for India. So it won't change uh, no matter who comes to power in the next upcoming election? I, yeah, I, well, I mean, if, if anyone would have changed that policy, I think it would have been Modi. Okay. Uh, and he hasn't, now, of course, if he comes back for another term and the situation deteriorates in Afghanistan, you can't rule anything out, but I do think it's, it's unlikely that that policy will change. All right, thank you. And I would, one last question. Uh, how would the um, militant landscape change in Afghanistan, uh, you know, with peace or without peace? Well, I think with the, let's suppose there peace is coming in Afghanistan, for example, in the next month or so. Let's suppose it. So uh, I think there are chances, as Umar mentioned, that some of the Taliban may, may not agree to uh, peace with the Afghan government as long as the U.S. troops are present there. That can provide them a chance, and there is already the ISKP, Islamic State of Khorasan province. This is already there and it's carrying out attacks inside and outside Afghanistan. So some of the Taliban groups may join for ideological reasons, uh, for monetary interest, because uh, we cannot say that all of the Taliban leadership, particularly the mid-ranking leadership, is 
purely fighting for ideological reasons with the Taliban. So it may take uh, some, some from the Taliban, Islamic State of Khorasan province, it's already there in Afghanistan. Then the Pakistani Taliban are also there in some parts of Afghanistan. So uh, I think the, but if you look at the Taliban, I think the major fighting group in Afghanistan is the Taliban. They are the mother of all fighting groups. So once they agree for peace, uh, there very little ground will be left for rest of them, like uh, psychologically or ideologically, because majority of the Taliban groups, with the exception of uh, ISKP, they believe that uh, Mullah Umar is the Amir al and they are getting inspiration was. from <laughs> was. Yes, they are getting inspiration. But he is still, I think, still. <laughs> they believe so. So they are getting inspiration from so his yes, from yeah. his leadership. So uh, uh, I think uh, once the Taliban agree, the top leadership agree for peace, I think that thing will be gone and then there will be very little ideological ground so left for us. Are they really a unified group as, as you are describing them? I, you know, how about the factions of Taliban? Some faction, you know, uh, uh, tending toward this country or the other or there is no such thing? Uh, I think, like generally speaking, they are a unified group. And the only uh, the reason, the major reason that we can believe that they are the unified group, when the Taliban leadership announced the ceasefire on Eid day, the three-day ceasefire, there was a complete ceasefire uh, inside Afghanistan. So that means there are not much differences. There must be some smaller level differences like organizational differences or rivalries inside different commanders from different areas or on different positions. But I don't think that once the leadership said that that's also, then they are accepting it. Okay. Uh, before we start uh, Q&A, do you want to add anything, uh, Omar? Michael, both of you. Uh, no, we'll you're take, fine. We'll fine. Take it to the, yeah. And please introduce I, yourself. I, I'm not. Oh, the <laughs> That's microphone. Uh, my name is uh, Arnold Zeitlin, and I've done reporting from uh, Afghanistan many years ago during the golden age in the early 70s. <coughs> One uh, for Dowd, um, you briefly mentioned the Islamic State. Uh, the U.S. military has pictured the Islam, Islam, remnants of the Islamic State in Afghanistan as a justification for keeping U.S. troops there. Uh, is this a, justifi uh, a justification? And two, uh, for Ambassador Samad, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned the discontent among the Afghan public because of the terrible uh, burden they have uh, carried for many years. How can this be channeled politically into some kind of impact on what's happening? So that, those are my two questions. Thank you for your question. And we are meeting for a second time, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think the justification is not only for the, uh, because of the ISKP, that must be uh, for several other reasons also. Uh, there are differences uh, among the Afghan leadership, there are like criminal groups, there are smuggling mafias, so these are all the agents of instability. It's not only the ISKP that can create some uh, instability, uh, that can create instability in Afghanistan. Uh, so far ISKP is concerned since this is a terrorist organization, it's carrying out bombing attacks and it has the infrastructure to target anywhere in Afghanistan, particularly in Kabul. So uh, this is why I think uh, uh, U.S. troops, I think they are justified to have some sort of U.S. troops because the Afghan army, it's, it's developing, it's progressing, and like it's making a lot of development over the years it had made. But I think it still needs some support, uh, particularly the air support in, in some areas. Uh, now, the, I, the story of ISKP is that once it was emerged in eastern Afghanistan and then they spread to northern Afghanistan. Uh, I think now in northern Afghanistan they are not that much strong, but now they are moving again to the top in the Kunar province in some areas. So they are moving around and they are, not be, ne, they, they are still far away from being uh, finished. So I think they can create problems like problems of terrorism, if not like taking over some areas because they don't have the capability and they never been the capability to take over some areas or some district like the Afghan Taliban, but they can create some problems security, from security point of view. Thank you for your question. Uh, I, I, I firmly believe, first of all, that um, 
Afghanistan is not just uh, the elites in the cities. Afghanistan has to be taken into account uh, with its rural population and it all its diversity. Uh, it's not just one group or another, one community or another. Uh, and what I do see, unfortunately, is over the last few years, a move towards elitism in the country where uh, everything is overly centralized and just if very few people decide about things that uh, may or may not affect people's lives. And so the war obviously has created a, a worsening situation overall across the board in many sectors. Uh, we have some successes, yes, we have made progress in certain ways, in some ways, and so on and so forth. But overall, if you look at the overall situation, um, it, it's very fragile. Uh, and so we need, we need solutions that are long-term, that are visionary, and that require good leadership. And that require uh, a mindset change from, uh, uh, that, that, that involves more Afghans in decision-making, that is more pluralistic, uh, and that uh, creates the big tent again, the Afghan big tent. I think that we have shrunk, and the tent, the tent has shrunk, and it keeps on shrinking. And in order to recreate it, uh, you need people with vision, people wi with a national reach, people who can, leaders who can think beyond their small uh, community interest or tribal interest or ethnic interest, whatever it may be, and think a bit more on the national scale and learn from the lessons of the last 18, 19 years uh, and, and uh, obviously apply measures that are ref reform-minded, real reform, not just slogans. We don't, we don't need no any more slogans in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and, um, and so how do you reach that at this stage when there's war is the big question. And so the big question obviously is how do you transition from what we have now, a very a s situation that's in disarray and fragmented. And so what we need basically at the end of the day is a unifier, someone who can really unify the country and not divide it further. And the more we are divided, the more problematic it becomes, not just for Afghans, but for the region and for others as well. Can I just you sure, you yes. Um, in, the, in response to the first question? Oh, sorry, yeah, on the ISIS question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think that what the, US is, what the U.S. is concerned about is not necessarily ISIS per se, though that certainly is part of the issue, but more Afghanistan reverting back to the terrorist sanctuary that it was in the late 90s. And it, essentially, US, the U.S. does not want history to repeat itself. And I think the question is, is that an, over, is that an overstated concern? Uh, you know, could Afghanistan really return to that uh, state? I think we can all agree that a, with a U.S. withdrawal could certainly hasten more destabilization in Afghanistan and lead to all kinds of problems, whether you're talking about uh, more Taliban takeovers, civil war, or whatnot. But in terms of you know, this, this sanctuary idea coming into be again, I don't know. I mean, Al-Qaeda is not as strong as it used to be. It's still there, but it's not as strong as it used to be. ISIS, um, you know, it clearly it's there. It, it stages attacks. It's resilient. I mean, ISIS has been getting hit in Nangarhar by U.S. Afghan airstrikes for several years, and it's still there, and it's still uh, staging attacks. But you know, uh, Afghanistan is somewhat of an, 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 a, an, an unfriendly neighborhood for, Afga for ISIS. I mean, you have most of these militant groups are aligned with al-Qaeda, and ISIS is a rival of al-Qaeda. Then you have the, sec the sect issue as well, ISIS being Salafist, most of these militant groups being Diobandi. So it makes it difficult, I think, to operate. Um, you know, broadening this to, to questions about the region, I think all of these surrounding states, including Iran and Russia, are very worried about ISIS. And you know, for all these, um, all this talk about how Iran may be providing uh, episodic levels of military support to the Taliban, why is that happening? One reason why it's happening could be to put the Taliban in an even better position to push back against ISIS, which it's been doing. So I think the broader question is, is that a legitimate concern that Afghanistan could become a, a, a place where its soil is used for uh, sanctuaries by terror groups? And I'm not sure if, if we have to worry about that threat as much as we did some years ago. A very important uh, point you mentioned, you know, the cultural differences, the language differences of uh, ISIS uh, people and, and the Taliban, where they are local. Yes. Hello. Um, my name is Mark Thomas Patterson, and I am a cam campus fellow for the International Institute of Peace, Democracy, and Development, and we are a non-governmental organization working on um, 
creating dialogue in Afghanistan. And one question that we have is, is that, um, or that I have, is, is that Afghanistan has a very large diaspora community um, ex and that is especially strong in the United States but as well as in Western Europe and around the world. And there hasn't been a lot of there has been some involvement recently of the diaspora in peace negotiations. What role do you see the diaspora playing in negotiations with the Taliban and with the um, Afghan government? Yeah. Go ahead, yeah, absolutely. But you must have read last night's piece in the Washington Post, right, about a group of Afghan emigres or expats who from Europe and the US and maybe other places went in Doha and had a chat with the Taliban for five or six hours, including three or four women, apparently, and discussed a host of issues. I think that any Afghan in any community of Afghans from wh wherever with the right intentions uh, can play a role. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, you know, representing a certain faction or group or political uh, uh, agenda. Uh, that's you know my overall view but obviously at some point it has to be organized and it has to be focused and it has to have a certain decorum I mean a few days ago uh, they were supposed to be a few dozen Taliban on one side and maybe uh, 100 150 Afghans on the other side trying to come together and as I said meet and greet not more than that mm -hmm. we failed everybody sort of failed in attempting that because all of a sudden several things happened. The numbers all of a sudden in the last 24 hours of that process were increased tremendously. Um, there were attempts by different political factions to uh, maybe exert, uh, impose a, in a, you know, their political path. agenda one way or the other. Uh, there were some uh, baseline agreements that had been reached that were not followed up with apparently and others who tried to uh, as I said, play a spoiler role, uh, some a constructive role. It's a very complex situation because it's not just one person or two people deciding. There was a there were a host of different um, uh, different uh, players involved. And the worst part was that everything happened within a very short period of time, just a few days. Where, whereas we have had month to work on this, and this is what troubles me. We have had month to work on this intra Afghan process and we leave it to the last minute, try to put together something that at the end of the day becomes unacceptable to either one side or the other. Mm -hmm. So we have to do a much better job of managing these, better leadership to drive this, and a focused uh, objective where we can bring all of the voices under a certain uh, 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 you know, umbrella, and then have them go and sit down with the other side. Uh, so, for, 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 for as far as the Afghans overseas are concerned, yes, they, they have to play a role as well. They can, uh, but it has to at some point become a more organized um, and a more credible mm -hmm. and viable process. But we are all under time pressure at, uh, mm -hmm. as well, yes. Oh, Michael, did you want to add anything to what uh, Omar said? No, no, okay. Not fine. Um, Kathy Kausman, uh, just a brief question on the Turkmen, the Tajik, the Uzbek minorities in Afghanistan and how they can be more involved uh, and how, you know, more effectively involved in, in peace processes and, and other issues. Um, because as you've, as many, as all of you know, it's a very highly diverse uh, society, country, etc. Thank you. They are in government, actually, on these minorities. Uh, Who wants you could go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I, I fully agree. I mean, uh, we are, as I mentioned earlier, a pluralistic society. We are a, a multi-ethnic society. That's a reality. It's a, it's a beautiful mosaic of different peoples living in one country who have a very strong sense of nationhood and have a strong sense of history and their com commonalities. And I think that that has to be invested in. And we need to make sure that they are vested in their future, that they feel they own their future, that they are part of the decision-making bodies and the decision-making processes. One of the biggest issues that we've had in Afghanistan, and I fully understand where it's coming from and is, is again, politicized, is the fact that we, we, we do not have accurate demographic statistics. 
our demographics are actually very distorted. And we have always, some of us have always said, we, we need to look at who we are, how are we, divide, you know, what are the numbers, where are we living, what are the conditions, a, you know, statistics that, are, that any nation needs for, for all kinds of reasons, economic, social planning, everything. But that hasn't happened. And at some point, I hope in the future we will, regardless of who's happy or who's not happy about it. We have to have this if we want to progress and move forward. And so whether you call them minorities, whether you call them communities, whether you call them this ethnic group or that ethnic group, they are part of that fabric. And I don't look at Afghanistan's issues as being ethnic. The problems are at the root not ethnic, and they're not religious. They're not even ideological to that point. To a certain level, they are. Obviously, our problems have to do with a lot of geography, a lot of history of the last 40 f years or so, uh, a, a lot of various interests within Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan that clash. And now we, try, we need to make sure that they stop clashing. We need to find ways where they can actually complement each other and find solutions that work, including solutions for all the Afghan communities that live in that country, uh, including women, sorry. If I could, it's, it's a great question, and I think it gets to this important issue that Ambassador Samad had brought up, that you have to get as many people as possible uh, talking. Um, and, uh, you know, we talk so much about how there needs to be a reconciliation process with the Taliban. I think you could argue there also needs to be a reconciliation process within Afghan, separate from the Taliban. And that's why, <coughs> you know, looking to this, this Loy of Jirga uh, in a few days or later this month is so significant, uh, when theoretically you're going to have a lot of people representing uh, stakeholders from across the board and needing to talk about Afghan uh, thoughts or ideas or how to move forward on peace without a role of the Taliban. But of course, this, this whole thing has become politicized as well. Talk about uh, President Ghani's opponents not being there. It's unfortunate. But that's why I think that theoretically there could be a lot of good things that could come out of a lawyer jargon if it's done the right way. If you try to have, if you really try to focus more on the intra-Afghan dialogue without the Taliban as well, that's important. Any other? Oh, uh, Mark. Uh, Marvin Weinbaum, the Middle East Institute. Uh, I'd like to get the panel's reaction to a different paradigm than I think so much of the discussion has been uh, taking place on. And it's one that accepts that the Taliban want peace, that the Taliban are not against negotiating, but that a strategic, <clears throat> an, a different strategic, there's been a strategic readjustment in Taliban's thinking over the last few years. And that is, whereas they saw this as a long drawn out process, militarily, of wearing down They've come to see that they can reach their ends politically, together with militarily, of course, but that the political is just as important. Why do they draw on this conclusion? They look at the ANSI Americans wanting to leave. They, they look at their substantial gains on the ground uh, where they are positioned to negotiate from position of strength. And they also look at the dysfunctionality, the disunity of the Afghan government. So that to them, a political route is just as promising or more so than, than a political. But that that route is premised on the idea that it can be on their terms. And that if they had wanted to negotiate on the terms that have been discussed, that process could have begun years ago. This is, they could have sat down and been hammering out Everything that's been discussed here 
that could have been in process. But they feel now that they can accomplish their ends uh, politically. That's a good question. Do they want peace at all? We'll all yeah. answer. Yeah, we'll uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your comment, Marvin. That is what I mentioned in the very beginning of my conversation, that uh, the, the, the Taliban, if they are expecting, and I, I think they are fully aware of uh, now the, uh, the, the, the Afghan landscape and now what is happening in Afghanistan and how the situation has changed since the mid-90s when they came there. Uh, I think they are also, not aiming for something like taking over the Kabul, taking over Kabul and the whole of Afghanistan with the with the use of guns and gun powders. Uh, I think they are very much uh, open to uh, political discussions and they want a role, uh, like a political role. And there are there are reasons to believe that uh, when the Taliban were coming. Uh, in the mid 90s or in the early 90s and they were taking over cities after cities and when they were garlanded in the streets of Kabul in 96 I guess 95 or 96 96 that was partly because of their like military strength but that was also because of the war weariness yeah. of the Afghan population that was also a reaction against the warlords. That was also a reaction against unemployment. That was also a reaction against hundreds of thousands of, of Afghans living in uh, Pakistan and Iran and in other areas. And they wanted some sort of, some messiah to come and take over everything and restore some kind of peace. When the news from Kandahar were reaching Kabul, that Kandahar is peaceful, there is no warlord. There are no taxes by the warlords. The Kabul people were getting ready for the Taliban and they were welcoming them. But now, when the people saw that peace can also be restored in Afghanistan without the Taliban, I'm talking about post 9-11. Em employment can be there, women rights, if women are coming out, that is not a big problem for the people. So then we saw the peace announcement, the ceasefire, the three-day ceasefire, when Afghan youths were taking selfies with the Taliban in the streets of Kabul. And when the ceasefire was over, many Taliban fighters did not return to their fighting. They stayed at their homes. We don't know the exact number, but that, these are the reports. And this is also one of the reasons that the Taliban are not announcing a ceasefire without making the U.S. announce the withdrawal date. Go ahead. Um, uh, Marvin, I, I, I agree with you that uh, the perception, the general view not right now, even within Afghanistan, is that we are in the midst of a paradigm shift. It may not have totally happened, but we are in the midst of it. And it's a process, and it's going to take time for this paradigm shift to settle down and find its, its roots, its new roots. Uh, and so that's why there are skeptics, there are pros and cons. It's for some people, it's very black and white. For somebody like me, who was one of the very first Afghans who stood up against the Talib Talibanization and Talibanism, and not in having my own argument as to why it's not good for us, and it's not good for the country, and it's not good for the world, maybe, uh, and stood up for the rights of women in 96, 97. For somebody like me, I think uh, now uh, I am skeptical, but cautiously optimistic as well that we are moving in that direction and that they have learned their lessons. So if the rest of Afghanistan hopefully has learned a few lessons, we're hoping that the Taliban also have learned some lessons. So knowing that there are diehards and radicals within the Taliban as well, there are spoilers within the Taliban as well, and we have to be very mindful of what happens the day after peace, if and when peace ha arrives, and how to deal with the rest of terror outfits and those who do not want to uh, 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 become peaceful and re reconcile. Um, and so, so we have to have measures in that regard. Uh, but uh, absolutely, I think that we need to take advantage of the opportunity that exists right now. And if we fail, we will have to answer to history one day maybe, and I hope we don't have to do that. 
Uh, if we don't take advantage of the opportunities that exist right now and the chances that exist right now, um, there's also a possibility that uh, it will end up reinforcing and strengthening the Taliban and within the Taliban, the more radicalized elements within the Taliban. And that not only are they not going to back off and not l lose because I don't see anyone coming back and fighting them the way they did a few years ago, even then it didn't really do much, but that they may actually you know, have more control over Afghanistan than they do right now. And so the question has to be posed, at what stage do you stop and seriously engage and try to save what you can and protect what is valuable and, and anything that the Afghan people agree to protect? And bring the Taliban who are for reconciliation in the, in, in, under the tent and and together move forward toward a new Afghanistan. And so that opportunity right now exists. What we need to do is make sure that we do not allow those who are spoilers and those who have other, other motivations and ulterior motivations, whether inside or outside the country, to take this chance away from the Afghans. There are risks, absolutely, but there are also opportunities. And we have to be careful, we have to be responsible, we have to be very thoughtful, we have to be smart. But the fact that they are sitting at the table with Afghan expats is an indication, is a small indication. It doesn't mean that they are fully changed. It doesn't mean that we can trust them fully. Once they are in power. But, right. but we have, oh, it depends on how power is shared. It depends on how democratic it is. The more democratic process. it is in the future, with the Taliban in it, the more secure it will be, sure. and the more the more stable it will be. The less democratic it is, the less stable it will be. So it's what kind of Afghanistan do we envisage, and how do how do we create that new Afghanistan together, without dividing ourselves furthermore? Okay. So uh, yeah, I think much of what should be said has already been said, uh, but uh, no, good good point, Marvin, for sure. Um, First point, I mean, as we all know, there have been talks before the Taliban. This is not the first time that the Taliban is engaging in talks. This is clearly the, the, the most progress that have been made in talks with the Taliban, but there have been back-channel talks going back to the Karzai era. That's happened. Um, but you know, I think for, for me, the big question is, um, what does the Taliban want? What we do, if we trust their propaganda, what they want is for the U.S. invaders to leave, for the foreign invaders to leave. And so that's why one reason why there's a significant amount of Taliban enthusiasm for the talks with the U.S. because they want to get a deal on a troop withdrawal. So the question is, when you, if you get that draft framework agreement that sets a plan for a troop withdrawal, does the Taliban continue to to talk and does it agree to talk to the uh, to the to the Afghan government? That's why I think it's right, as I think I would mention. And you know, the, the U.S. government should, however you do this, and it won't be easy. You should not agree to start withdrawing troops in Afghanistan until there's a clear assurance that the Taliban is going to abide by a ceasefire and talk with the Afghan government. Um, but it's hard to know um, at this point. Um, you know, I think the broader question here, getting back to this, what does the Taliban want? There, there seem to have been efforts by the group in the last few years to project itself as sort of a more moderate Taliban 2.0 type <laughs> thing. Um, you know, in terms of its willingness to, to talk to women and, and, and that type of thing. But, you know, the areas that are of Afghanistan that are controlled by the Taliban, where there have been efforts by journalists, and particularly from the West, to go there and see what's going on, the, the, tr the, the record is not very good. There's a lot of troubling things happening in these areas that the Taliban control, so that's concerning. And then there's the ideological uh, factor as well. Um, you know, the Taliban is long claim that it really rejects this idea. It, re it rejects the current government in, in Afghanistan. It, it doesn't seem to be that fond of, demo of, of elections and democracy. Would it really be willing to participate in a system, in the existing political system? I think that's, that's a big question. Excellent. So you're uh, yes, finished. Oh, very quick. Uh, this short question from Mr. Michael. As you clearly mentioned about the Afghanistan uh, Taliban, why uh, Afghanistan future is uh, cloudy? And my second part of the question, so what do you think about the next uh, f 
future of the negotiation between Taliban and the United States. However, Mr. Khalizad started their, uh, his next trip to Afghanistan and region yesterday. So what is the problem, the negotiation between Taliban and the United States tax? And uh, yeah, a lot of this yeah, this is my second question from Mr. Khatak. Uh, however, India and Pakistan bringing some uh, like uh, kind of proxy war to Afghanistan, uh, the helping Afghanistan in humanitarian assistance, for example, Pakistan is uh, inaugurate an hospital in Kabul. India is helping military Afghanistan or other parts. Can you clear? what kind of problem they have in Afghanistan that India or Pakistan wants to stop each other in Afghanistan. So I am Faizi from Voice of America in Afghani from Afghanistan service. Okay. Uh, should I go first? Yes, please. So uh, yeah, to, to your question, I mean, in terms of why the future is cloudy, I think it's just that you have a perfect storm of major, uh, mm -hmm. of, of uncertainty involving a number of key events. We don't know uh, we don't know if there's going to be a deal between the U.S. and the Taliban. We don't know if, if there is a deal, if the Taliban will be willing to talk to the Afghan government and what would happen from that point, whether there's an interim government option or, if, or, or what. Um, we don't know if the election is going to happen. So there's just a lot of, it's, it's just a moment of uncertainty in the broader context of volatility within the Afghan government, given what's going on within it and, and without it. Um, in terms of the, to the talks with the United States, they, they will resume, I'm sure. I don't think that a date has been sent. Originally, I had heard that it was going to be later, at some point later this month. Um, I don't think the fact that the, um, the intra-Afghan dialogue in Doha was postponed will affect the, the status of the U.S. Taliban talks. It, it, it's true that the U.S. government really wanted those, um, those discussions, icebreaker activities, whatever you want to call it, in Doha. They wanted those to go on. But that's not going to affect these talks. I mean, as we've discussed already, you know, the, Trump, Trump, the Trump administration and Trump in particular really wants a deal, and he wants it now. So that's going to compel the U.S. side. And the Taliban will be happy to, to, to go along with that because it wants, to, it wants the invaders out of the country. Yeah. Yeah, very briefly, the because question. the question is coming in the very, the most important question is coming in the very Today. end of our conversation. Uh, I think Pakistan, Afghanistan, basic problem is different line, you know. There is a problem. Both countries are like their inimical approach towards each other lies in the divisions of the border between these two. And India-Pakistan problem also lies in the border between the two countries. Now Pakistan is fighting, Pakistan and India are fighting in Kashmir. They are opposing each other because there they are sh if that is removed then there is no problem between India and Pakistan there must be minor problems but they can be solved Pakistan and India moved their conflict to Afghanistan and there for example Pakistan believes that whatever it's doing there on that side uh, India India is doing the same thing on the other side of it so there exists the problem to your question let me wrap it up in a few words to your question if both of them comes to cooperation, that will be an ideal situation. I don't think that what we think here, the policy makers are thinking over there. They have some different approaches. But in ideal conditions, if they come to uh, like a kind of cooperation, I think Afghans will welcome both India and Pakistan. There will be no problem with them. OK, so it's more complicated. Than that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dawood Khattak from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Radio Mashal, uh, Ambassador uh, Omar Samad, and Michael <coughs> Kugelman. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming here today.